Shalom Chavrim, I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live, and today we have a special guest. Uh, it is Dave Gaheri. Uh, he is uh, the author, also a journalist, has written and studied extensively on the attack on, uh, by Israel on the USS Liberty back in 1967. In fact, that was June 8, 1967 that this attack occurred. Uh, there were 34 people, uh, sailors killed on the ship here. I think it was 171, something like that, that were actually injured. There has been all types of stories about the USS Liberty, uh, cover-ups, uh, Israel never fully acknowledging their part in this attack, brushing it kind of under the rug, just saying it was an accident. We mistaken them for an Egyptian ship, and that happened there. And then, of course, the U.S. government as well. That seems to be the the bigger mystery in this than anything. 18 hours after this ship had been attacked, uh, they were still stranded in the water waiting for the help that was actually only 20 minutes away. At least that's some of the reports that we've seen out there. Uh, everything from President Lyndon B. Johnson saying he wanted the, the GD ship at the bottom of the sea. And some of these things are not necessarily true, or at least the evidence doesn't support that. And we want to get into those things and really uncover what actually happened and hopefully uh, get some uh, answers and maybe get the U.S. government and the Israeli government to actually step forward and really uh, uncover and explain what really happened and give the survivors a peace of mind. There is actually in the progress right now uh, with uh, Mr. Gehari, Dave Gehari, and some of the survivors there of the USS Liberty, a full-length uh, motion picture that they're working on. And in fact, at the end of this broadcast, you will see the trailer for that. And, uh, and of course, the way that you can help support that if that is something you so desire to do. Uh, Dave, thank you for joining us here with, on Israeli News Live. Glad to have you here and look forward to the insightful information you will be sharing with us today. It's an honor to be here, Stephen. Thank you so much for reaching out to, to us and, and having me on your show. Thank you. Uh, you know, Dave, I have watched a number of your interviews already, uh, and even with Phil Turney, uh, I've watched the interviews with him as well, and it has been really eye-opening to me. And of course, I, I am Jewish by birth. Israeli News Live, our very name, you know, is another big issue, you know, but we like to look into the situations um, uh, in, our, in our past in our government, and we just want to get some answers uh, dealt with, especially some of the, our, the dark history of Israel that we've gone through. I mean, uh, there's a lot of people out there that say that, you know, Israel is just a Zionist nation. There is some truth to that because, after all, there were definitely some very sinister things that were happening in the background at the beginning of the nation of Israel, the sinking of the Altalina uh, by uh, Moshe, uh, um, excuse me, Moshe Sharit, David Ben Gurion, Yitzhak Rabin. Very, very serious situation that happened in Israel, and all through the history of our of our country, there's been some very things that have, that have happened that are not pleasant and things that we don't like. And the USS Liberty uh, definitely ranks very high on that list. And we still continue to see cover-ups. Uh, we have the ringworm children, Israel getting the nuclear bomb and what they did, throwing the Sephardic children under the bus there, the, the Jews that were coming from the Arabic lands there, letting the U.S. government do radio, radioactive tests on them just to be able to get a nuclear bomb. So, uh, But it doesn't mean that all the Jewish people are bad by no means. In fact, the, the majority of Israelis uh, are troubled by the things that have happened and how the government has covered it up. Even the ex assassination of Yitzhak Rabin, my good friend Barry Chamish, who recently passed away, that exposed that story. But today, we're here, uh, we're here Dave, to talk about the USS Liberty, and I would just really be uh, delighted if you can kind of go share a little bit about yourself, how you got involved in the research on this, and, and, and then tell us about what actually did happen that day in 1967. Sure. I, I wish I was, in, in many ways, I wish I was there, but I was only seven when that happened, and when I first started to study it, I would use the word, the word attack, or sometimes the word incident, 
is used, and sometimes that word is used to alleviate the seriousness of the event or event, then I started to call it massacre. What happened was I was basically just wasting my life away, and I decided that I wanted to do something, and I suddenly came upon the idea of going in the Navy, and I went and told, I told my dad, and he took me to the recruiter a couple of towns away, and I said, okay, I'm sure they were excited about seeing somebody actually coming in there. And I asked him, I said, what's the, you know, what's the toughest thing you got for, for enlisted? And he said, well, um, being a nuke on uh, subs. So I said, okay. Let's try it. And I had, this was back in, uh, <clears throat> I think 2011 was the first time that I interviewed Phil Turney. I started writing for the newspaper American Free Press, I think in 2010 or 2011. And one of their signature stories that never gets any play by the corrupt mainstream media was about the liberty. And... So I interviewed Phil Turney, and then I met him perhaps the next year or the year after at a free speech conference in Texas, and then it was in August of 2015, as we were moving from New Jersey down to the panhandle of Florida, that Phil called me in the evening as I was driving a I think it was like a Penske truck through the mountains of Pennsylvania. And he, he, he wanted to do something. He didn't quite know what he wanted to do, but he wanted to do something. And this is how this all began. And we started by talking over Skype and spending hours and hours and hours going through his first book, which was called What I Saw That Day which was primarily written by a fellow by the name of Mark Glenn and with, uh, with, with obviously consulting with Phil, as this book was done, Erasing the Liberty in, in the same fashion. And I found things in the first book that were not quite correct, and I found out the information. I began to dig and dig and dig, and it became uh, somewhat of uh, an occupation um, finding out about the liberty, and we, when we were talking about, well, what do you, what do we, what do you want to do? You know, and came up with the with the idea of the book, not coming up with it in an inorganic way, like saying, oh, let's write a book. It came up organically by going through the old book and then elaborating on the the. the the facts or the the mistakes that were in the book and trying to get more information about stuff. I asked Phil, I said, well, and of course this was before the 50th observance of the massacre slash terror attack, because it was, there was nothing pretty about what Israel did to this ship. Dave, wasn't there a situation where um, there were there was a, a couple of other people that were working on doing a movie, uh, and then when they actually got the funding for the movie, that they ended up, whether it be mysteriously dying or whatever the case may be, can you kind of give us a little, just a, just a brief synopsis of what this issue was? Yes, there were two fellas, one in the 80s and one in the 90s, the first guy's name was Norm Wallen, and Norm supposedly, and again, this is from information I've, I've read, it's actually in, this information about Norm is in a book called um, The USS Liberty Dissenting History Versus Official History, which is a great book. The fellow wrote it for his dissertation, John Bourne, and B-O-R-N-E, and what happened with Norm supposedly was that just when he was securing the financing, he committed suicide. And Phil knew him and he was in touch with him and he got a call from his wife, from Norm's wife, and said, she told Phil what happened. And she said, I, I'm not going to talk to you ever again. And she took off and, and that was it. 
I don't know if it was 10 years later, but it was the next decade where a fella who was former, I think, um, I think it was CIA, uh, this fella, he was at the 35th <clears throat> reunion of the Liberty, I think in Pensacola, and he was driving home alone, and he had a one-car crash. And he had just secured funding ostensibly for a film. And uh, I can't remember the fellow's name now, but it'll come to me and I'll, I'll tell you later on. Well, you know, but, Dave, uh, this, yeah. is, this has got to be a little bit nerve-wracking for you guys uh, to be even, uh, you know, now you're the third time around working on securing the funding for making a movie uh, that gives the factual information about the uh, the attack on the USS Liberty, and, you know, how does that make you guys feel? I mean, you get one guy that allegedly commits suicide, his, his wife, and uh, if I'm not mistaken, does she have a son or a daughter, and they both disappeared? And yeah. has anyone ever heard from them ever again, or they have just literally vanished off the face of the earth? Yeah, the other fellow's name was Dick Thompson. Okay. Um, but uh, I don't know if it was a son or a daughter. I can find that out. But I thought that Phil said that he hadn't talked to them again, but then I thought I heard him saying that he did talk to her one more time. Uh, but uh, whatever the case may be, the guy is dead. I personally am not feeling uh, nervous about doing this. At this point, nothing's happened. I understand why the powers that be would want to stop this from happening it's very clear if this true story was allowed to play out on the silver screen or on a DVD or online it would create a lot of issues for not just Israel but for the United States government probably more for Israel because of the way that the attack was carried out so I do know that there will be there will be repercussions for me in the future when we really start to pound the pavement to get the funding and do the film this year. But I, 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 I can't. Back down. Like, well, you know, Dave, the, just the fact that you're on Israeli News Live is probably going to cause a windstorm for you to begin with. I mean, for one, it will help to, uh, and, and what our desire is, is to help the to educate the public because the people that watch Israeli News Live are from a very, very broad perspective here. Uh, we have Israelis, we have uh, the Christian community in, um, around the world. I can't just say America. It is literally from around the world. Many of these people are supporters of Israel. Uh, and at the same time, more and more, they recognize the difference between the Zionist movement versus that of uh, the, the Jewish people that just want to see the coming of their Messiah. And uh, But yet there are these lingering issues that are out there. And this is a major one, really, because it's, it's really unsettled. And uh, uh, if you, we can, let's get right into the, the incident, what happened, if you can kind of walk us through there and, uh, you know, so that people can kind of get a feel for what's going on. Because some people we got to keep in mind that will be watching, they'll be like scratching their head, USS Liberty, what in the world is this all about? I haven't heard about right. this before. Right, sure. It's, it, with the Liberty, it really, it really all started during World War II. And the Liberty was what, what was called a victory hull ship. And a lot of these ships were made uh, simply for the purpose of hauling cargo and troops from the United States to the uh, to the theaters of war, to the European theaters of war and the Pacific theater uh, theaters of war, and this ship was called the SS uh, Simmons Victory, and the Simmons Victory uh, made a bunch of trips uh, across the Pacific, and I think even in the even in the Korean War as well, and then it was mothballed. And then the United States uh, came up with the idea that they would take some of these mothballed ships 
and turn them into seaborne listening platforms. So ELINT, they call them, E-L-I-N-T, electronic intelligence. Spy ship. Uh, <laughs> sorry? A spy ship. Let's just call it what yeah, it is, right? <laughs> exactly. A spy ship. That's right. Okay. So what they what they did was they, they pulled them out of mothballs and they equipped them with all the gear that they would need. The Liberty had a crew of about 300, and about 200 of that crew were spies, uh, mostly Navy spies, communications technicians. They call them today, I think, cryptologic technicians. And so what happened was the there were, I think, five of them, and the Liberty was called AGTR-5. That was its, its name. Like, for example, this submarine I was on, the USS Skate, was called SSN-578. Some people think that stands for Submersible Ship Nuclear. So the Liberty was AGTR-5. So they had five of them. They had an AGTR-1 through 5. And AGTR stood for Auxiliary General uh, Technical Research. So, which means nothing, right? It was basically, it was a spy ship. So what they did, they equipped it with uh, 45 antennae, and one of them was uh, called a Trescom. It was a, uh, a big uh, dish that could bounce signals off of the moon and then from the moon going to NSA headquarters in Maryland in a matter of seconds, provided they could both see the moon, the ship, and the and the NSA headquarters at the time. And so all they would do was, the Liberty's job was to troll the west coast of Africa because there were a lot of, um, remember we're talking, we're, we're, we're in colonial times still. Yes. And uh, there are the colonial powers, uh, and it's still going on. It's, it's funny, what, what happened then is still happening today, uh, especially with what's happening in the Middle East with Syria and Israel. But what happened was the, uh, the Liberty would troll up and down the west coast of Africa from, from South Africa all the way up to, uh, I think, um, uh, Abidjan uh, was, uh, one of, was the port. And they would just, let's say, five knots, which is about five miles per hour. They would just go up and down in international waters and just listen and pick up electronic communications and then transfer that back. So on board the Liberty, they had linguists. So let's say if they were in Africa, they would have Portuguese linguists, or let's say the Chinese were there. The, you know, the, the People's Republic of China was in whatever African countries there were. They'd have Chinese linguists, Arabic linguists, Russian linguists. So on, I think it was May 22nd, the uh, United States, women, the, the Liberty was under the command of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the National Security Agency. So the National Security Agency ordered the, ordered the Liberty to leave Africa on May 22nd and proceed to Rota, Spain to drop off some linguists and pick up some others who were more specialized in where they were gonna, going to go, which was in the Eastern Mediterranean, and they were more specialized in Arabic and even Russian. And the reason is, is because the Soviet Union at the time, obviously they had some uh, relations with, for example, Egypt, which wasn't called Egypt back then, it was called the United Arab Republic. And there's a lot of history about how Nasser, who seems to be the main person here who instigated this whole thing, uh, Nasser tried to have warmer relations with the United States. Actually, that was just about to happen, and Kennedy was, was murdered in broad daylight, and that put an end to that. Uh, the Israelis always wanted to make sure that the United States didn't have warm relations with Egypt or any of the other countries around them, and that's just, again, this is just information that anybody uh, can read and find out about. Uh, of course, when you start to talk about this stuff, the first thing, <clears throat> you know, the people who don't want it out say, oh, you're anti-Israel, you're anti-Semitic, you're a Jew hater, and that has nothing to do with the facts. The facts are that <clears throat> Nasser was in a position where he 
close the uh, the Straits of Tehran, which choked a, some Israeli shipping, but it really was an insignificant amount of shipping. I think it was like 5% of what Israel exported. Uh, but that's what really got this whole thing going. Dave, yeah, why, so. why would Israel um, not want the U.S. to have a relationship with, uh, with Nassar there in Egypt? What, was, what would be the purpose for this? Well, it's very simple. Uh, they, they don't want the United States, they didn't, and they don't want the United States to have warm relations with any a Arab country in the region, because then that will then, in their view, compromise their position with the United States. So just like, for example, if we see uh, anyone today in the United States wanting to say something about the Palestinian cause, immediately they're attacked, uh, whether it's uh, uh, Gigi Haddad, the uh, model who's half Palestinian, or whether it's uh, uh, an actor or an actress, or Roger Waters, or Oliver Stone said something, and uh, the attack starts. Uh, the reason that that is being done is because if it's allowed to play out, same thing with the liberty. If the story is allowed to play out about the Palestinians, if a human face is allowed to be put on the Palestinians, if, for example, the news coverage says instead of uh, 60 Palestinians died in Gaza, like what did they do? They had heart attacks and they just passed out? No. Versus, well, 60 Palestinians were brutally murdered by the Israel, Israel Defense Forces. So... With Nasser, it's the same thing. If Nasser had the chance to meet with Kennedy, two young, charismatic leaders, and they were able to hammer out a deal, then the United States would not need Israel as much as they would prior to that happening. Okay, okay. So as then we move forward then. Um, right, the, they, left, they left Rota, Spain. They they dropped off certain linguists. They picked up others. They picked up three Marines and three civilians in Rhoda. And so the crew was 294, about 200 spies and about 100 of the crew. And the crew, what they were, was uh, sailors that made the ship run. So, for example, when I was in the Navy, I was known as a nuke uh, because that's what I did. And the, the fellows who were forward of the reactor compartment were called pukes because they were just stupid. So they were the nukes and the pukes. It was the same thing on this ship. You had the spies, the spooks, and you had then the, uh, the ship's company, you know, the, the grunts, the snipes, the, the lowlifes. And there's still that animosity that exists between the crew. Exactly, exactly. And by the way, guys, when you're speaking about spies in the Navy there, is, these, are, these are linguists that are trained to be able to listen in to whether it be radio communication or whatever type of communications that are going on. Uh, eavesdropping, I guess, is another way to put it there. So it's not like that they're actually jumping off the ship and slipping into the harbor there and uh, spying in that, that way. This is actually an intelligence gathering ship. And as you mentioned, Dave, 45 antennas on there to gather that information uh, was, was something that was very important. Important. So, uh, continue on. Continue on. Very interesting. Yes. So, so they left Rhoda and they were going down to the Eastern Mediterranean to uh, get in get in their station, uh, which was uh, off the at that time the um, it wasn't the Israeli controlled Gaza coast, but it was the Egyptian controlled Gaza coast, and uh, just to do like a little uh, oval uh, and just spin around in international waters off of El Arish and Gaza, and just pick up uh, whatever signals they could, because again, they remember what we're dealing with here. You're, you're in 1967, Vietnam is, you know, going full bore. Of course, this, by the way, most of the Liberty guys hold Johnson in such low regard and have so much contempt for him and, 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 it, and rightfully so, uh, that this guy got the United States involved deeper into this Vietnam matter because of this false flag, this lie about the Gulf of Tonkin incident. 
So you've got body bags coming back from Vietnam. You've got a lot of tension. You've got the possibility of some kind of a flare-up, in, especially in that region. So you've got Nasser, who, as I mentioned, tried to reach out to the United States. Kennedy was killed. Johnson was, is possibly uh, the, uh, uh, the president that uh, had the warmest relations with Israel and Jews. And Johnson was half Jewish on his mother's side, which isn't something that is really talked about in the media. Um, so he was surrounded by American Jewish Zionists who knew more about what was happening in Israel with this so-called Six-Day War than Johnson knew himself. So they were kind of serving two masters, and I think this is something that is touched upon a lot and leads to these calls about anti-Semitism and anti-Jewishness is the dual loyalty. So you've got uh, Jewish people in the United States who are Americans, uh, and some of them, like for example, uh, during the Iraq war, uh, the neocons, as they call them, uh, I think something like um, almost all of them were Jewish. And there's a lot of people who say, well, are these people serving the interests of the United States? Is it in the United States' best interest to go into Iraq on a false premise of weapons of mass destruction? Or is this in the best interests of Israel? And that the fact that these all of these neocons are Jewish, are they serving the interests of Israel because they're Jewish? So this is something that's been around for a a lot longer than we have, and it's something that's going to be around. So it's in the background as well. Johnson was surrounded by, by uh, Zionists, uh, wealthy Zionists, who were serving the interests of Israel, including Matilda Krim. She wasn't Jewish, but she was married to a Jewish fellow who was uh, Arthur Krim, who was the head of, the, um, of United Artists, where Johnson got a lot of his campaign contributions from. Arthur Goldberg... Um, a lot of them, big, big time American Jewish Zionists. So, well, you know, it's kind of interesting, Dave, when you bring this out like this, because what, what I've watched a lot of over the years is a direct connection between uh, some of these Zionist leaders and that of Jesuit leaders as well, almost working hand in hand. In fact, there was a interesting debate that I watched between Eric Phelps and I forget the other gentleman's name. Eric took, of course, the, took, took the Jesuit side. Uh, the other gentleman took the uh, the the. Um, the Zionist side of who's actually controlling the world. And to me, it's almost like they've worked hand in hand. I, I've done a lot of research seeing how the, this happened uh, back uh, during World War II in order to create the, the state of Israel, how the, the Jewish people that were wanting to flee uh, Nazi Germany and what was going on there were being turned back sent to their deaths, you know, but at the same time uh, the evidence that was uh, Jewish people turning in their own people, sending 8,000 to their death while uh, 300, which by the way Ben Gurion was one of those 300 that was uh, smuggled through the rat lines of the Vatican and sent to, as they call it, Palestine to create the state of Israel. So it's been like a loyalty hand in hand. And I, I, I think of recently when Pope Francis was in Israel and he went to the Holocaust Memorial, he's sitting there seeing kissing the hands of the Rothschilds and, uh, and several other uh, elite families there. So it's a very sinister thing going on. And this is what I see over and over and over. And that's what interests me about the USS Liberty is that there is a sinister plot, whether it be in Lyndon B. Johnson's administration co cohertly working and uh, even the book that I was working on reading at one point there about the Viet you mentioned Vietnam and the Vietnam War being a far more sinister war than what most people realize. Uh, so this is one thing I guess guys what you are there that are listening here today uh, you got to keep that in mind this is you know what we're trying to get to here is the bottom of what really happened and why and we've got to realize as I've shared with you guys so many times before if you just look at Daniel's prophecy he says the violent among your people will try to establish the vision or marry the vision so 
we got some bad eggs in Israel. It's plain and simple. It's laying there. It's right there in your own Bible. And, and, and we've got to deal with this. If we're ever going to get some kind of normalcy and treat our neighbors as ourselves, you know, Palestinians are human beings. And, uh, you know, and I think it was, who was it, Ron Paul that actually brought out that Hamas was created by the Mossad? Barry Chamish has talked about that before, talked about it right here on Israeli News Live. So, uh, we may be a little bit longer in this broadcast than anticipated, but I think we need to bring these, this information out because it's a once-in-a-lifetime chance. And later we'll be talking to survivors as well in the coming uh, months here to where you can hear some of their thoughts on this as well. Go ahead, Dave. Yeah, sure. Yeah, that's very important. And, of course, it isn't by, by all means just, just one uh, country that's doing this. It takes two to tango. And, yes. Uh, what happened was that uh, <clears throat> the Liberty, the Liberty was doing its job. It got down there on, on the seventh, I believe late. Now what happened was that, and then this is something that's completely left out of the, I guess the mainstream. And I'm, I shouldn't say mainstream because the mainstream media has done and is still doing its best to make sure that the story doesn't get out. So uh, when I say the mainstream, I mean the sources that talk about the liberty. They don't really talk about this, and, and I, I don't know why that is. Maybe it's, maybe it's something that just fell through the cracks. Uh, but, but I believe that this is accurate, is that on, on June 7th, the, the day before, the night before the, the massacre, terror attack. The uh, defense attache in Tel Aviv was told by the government of Israel to tell, for him to tell the United States, his government, to get the liberty out, to get it away. And that's when these messages, these supposed messages, were sent from NSA and the Joint Chiefs of Staff to pull the liberty a hundred miles away from the coast. Now the Liberty was, I think about 45 miles away from Tel Aviv. They weren't there to uh, eavesdrop on the Israelis. Not only were there no Hebrew linguists on board, but the U S Navy was forbidden from intercepting messages from two countries, one, the United Kingdom and two Israel. The U.S. Navy was, not the U.S. Air Force. So these messages supposedly, and this is another part of this whole liberty mystery, the, these, all of these messages that were sent were misrouted. <laughs> they never got to the liberty. Here's the most sophisticated seaborne listening platform in the world with 45 antenna, like you said, and they missed all the messages. They ended up in the Philippines, here, there, everywhere but the liberty, supposedly. I've had Liberty survivors tell me that it's impossible for these messages to have missed the Liberty because of the way that the system functioned at the time. If you're going to send a message to a ship that was in the Sixth Fleet, well, the entire Sixth Fleet would get it, and then it would be routed to the or appropriate, or the appropriate vessel would pick it up. Well, what happened was that once all the dust settled and they... they came up with this reason that why these messages didn't get to the Liberty or the fact that they didn't get to the Liberty in time, there was a hearing done in the early eighties, uh, a house at that time, it wasn't a, a part of a committee. Now it is part of the house appropriations committee. They studied the, uh, defense Department of Defense uh, communications network, and they wanted to find out why why it was that these messages failed to get to the Liberty. That wasn't the whole ex the, the whole um, extent of the committee's uh, purview. They just that was part of it. The Liberty was part of it. So uh, one of the things that happened was a CIA official testified in front of the committee, and the ch the head of the committee, the chair of the committee, was a Representative Robert L. F. Sykes, who was the congressman in the first district of Florida, which I'm in the first district of Florida. 
And of course, Bob Sykes has passed on, and now we have this <clears throat> Matt Getz or Gates, however you say his name. Um, but what happened was this CIA director or CIA official, he testified to uh, to the committee that Israel warned the United States via the defense attaché in Tel Aviv to get the liberty out or they, or they will attack it. And those messages can get through. So this was verified by an author uh, of this book, Taking Sides, Stephen Green, who just sadly just passed on recently. This was corroborated by uh, some other people on the committee that, yes, in fact, this did happen. I have no reason to doubt that. So Israel knew. Go ahead. I'm why then would why would Israel supposed to be an ally, maybe not officially an ally of the United States, send a message to the U.S. to get the USS Liberty out when it's 45 miles offshore? Uh, or they're going to sink it. Why would they even suggest something like this? Yeah. It was 45 miles away from Tel Aviv. It was uh, between 12 and, uh, 12 and a half and 14 miles away from the coast. So it was in international waters. But you have to remember here, um, the United States and Israel, as you mentioned, they're, at this point they're not allies uh, officially. Because there is no mutual defense pact or treaty signed between the two countries. And the reason that there isn't is that if they were allies, then they'd have to share information with their other ally. And uh, they don't want to do it. As uh, a former CIA analyst told me that uh, Israel prefers to, instead of uh, signing any uh, alliance with the United States and then having to explain to them, hey, we're going to go into Lebanon or Syria or we're going to do this or that, that they'd rather work from the position of, oh, we're sorry, we did this, we apologize. It, you know, it's easier for them. Um, so why would they then warn the United States that they would attack this ship? Well, obviously because they had something to hide. And what a lot of people don't understand is that even though the U.S. and Israel are not official allies, uh, they do have a strong alliance that began after World War II between the Central Intelligence Agency and the Mossad. So the, the main reason that tied these organizations together was the Cold War and communism. Now, most uh, communists at the time, prominent communists, were Jewish as well. And so there were a lot of ties between the people living in Israel and people living in, in Russia. Uh, most, I think most of the, uh, the main communists were Jewish, and most of the people who formed Israel came from like a certain region in Russia. Two, two, so, million, two million Jews today living in Israel are Russian. In fact, it's the third most spoken language in the country. Right, exactly. So uh, the, the uh, Central Intelligence Agency, who was obsessed with uh, communism, uh, and the Mossad, they worked together, and that was really what that laid the foundation for the relationship between the U.S. and Israel. But at the same time, there were a lot of Israelis, there were a lot of Jews who detested the United States uh, because they blamed the United States for the Holocaust. They blamed the United States for not doing enough to get enough Jews out. And so there are stories. Again, this is uh, this information is out there for anybody to it's true. learn. It's true. It's true. I mean, yes, Jewish people they know that. I mean, after all, I mean, the one ship that went to the United States uh, got turned back. Or no, I think about what did they do? They rescued. I forget now the statistics on yeah, it. Yeah, they didn't. They did. They didn't let it dock. Right. Right. So we had one that right. went back. I think finally the U.S. did take in uh, one group of Jews. But I mean, this is this. Yes, it was. It was a tragedy for the Jewish people. I mean, I had family members on both sides. My parents, parents, especially my mother, that lost an enormous a number of people in her own family. And uh, you know, but but nonetheless. There's so many dark things about what happened with the Holocaust and uh, and even uh, how it was orchestrated and who was really behind it, which we we're not going to get into that today, but uh, we'll save right, that for, right. a, for a future a other, issue. Exactly. That's, that's a whole other story. But <clears throat> there, were, there were people in positions of power in Israel that really didn't like the United States. And they didn't like the fact that the United States was telling them what to do. 
and they had their own plans for what they wanted to do with Israel. They wanted to attack Egypt, they wanted to attack Jordan, they wanted to uh, attack Syria. The problem was that the, and, and we're, I'm just concentrating on and focusing on why they would tell them to get out of the way, because they had plans to go into Syria. And that's why I say things that are happening today are almost identical to what happened over 50 years ago. It's incredible. It's that same great game in the Middle East. Well, you know, Dave, you bring up a very interesting point. I know this may be a little bit off subject, so I won't go into this deeply, but I will say that what I see from 1967 and that of today, and I, and I credit this to actually one of the interviews I saw you in with Phil, uh, you had mentioned that, and when you did, uh, it immediately began to make more sense because I knew that uh, uh, in what we're seeing today, there is the, and I, I hate to say it, guys, you have to just realize this is really an issue here. There is what they call the Zionist Project, and that's to take the lands from the Euphrates River all the way to the Nile River and to make the Greater Israeli Project. But that's actually a New World Order vision is what it is, and a lot of people don't realize that. Uh, just how big that is. And we know that President Trump has made that very ominous statement with Prime Minister Netanyahu when he said they're working on a regional uh, initiative for this two-state solution, uh, more like a one-state. And it definitely seems to be that in 1967, there was a desire to see this happen back then, uh, that this is really what was supposed to take place, was to conquer these nations, get this new world order started, uh, maybe a different terminology at that point, but that kind of went by the wayside and because of the way things went with the war. But it's on the table again, and they're not going to give up. I, I really don't, I can see it happening, Dave, is they're not going to give it up. Uh, when I see so many Christian friends saying Isaiah 17, Damascus is going to be destroyed, and I say, well, I read Hebrew, read on down. You get to verse 10, and God blames Israel for it happening. And he says, it's because you have forgotten the rock of your, uh, of your uh, you've forgotten the God, your, your God and the rock of your salvation. Uh, and he's actually implying not just this modern state of Israel, he's implying all 12 tribes. So that could have something to do with the U.S.'s involvement with Israel today in the Middle East. Continue on, Dave. I'm sorry about getting you sidetracked. <laughs> no, no, not, not at all. It's, it's, all, it's all tied in, uh, which is fascinating, and that gets back to if people would just spend more time reading and less time trying to do something, then I think we'd have a much better world because you would understand. People would understand more, uh, obviously. But Israel was planning on... on going into Damascus, and we know this because the Soviet Union had secured uh, landing rights uh, in Yugoslavia from Tito. They were, they were going to uh, land their, um, their cargo planes with uh, paratroopers on board and drop them in between Damascus and Israel. They were ready for battle. Uh, we were pretty close to World War III. Uh, there's also talk about uh, nuclear armed planes flying to Cairo and three minutes away from dropping, uh, dropping their weapons on Cairo because the whole plan about the liberty was attack it, sink it, blame it on Egypt, false flag, and get the U.S. involved going at it. I mean, that's a theory that, that, that's going around, uh, that has been going around, and a lot of people subscribe to it. There's a book called Operation Sinai that talks about this. There's is, not much is, evidence. Okay, so there's not evidence for it. Uh, but then, so it brings us back to the question, though, Dave, is why would Israel then attack the ship? And, of course, we know, like you said, it was 45 miles from Tel Aviv, but 12 miles, 12 miles off the coast, which kind of makes sense because uh, 12 miles, after you go beyond 12 miles, you're not going to see land anymore. Uh, I don't care how high your mass is on your ship there, so I'm assuming that their technology uh, could only go of a line of sight. Is that correct? correct. Yeah, line of sight, but they, they were able to see the minarets in El Arish. So they, did, they were able to see that. Um, that's right, line of sight. And I think Israel was concerned that the Liberty would pick up signals that showed that they, they didn't know that there were no Hebrew linguists on there. Let's say the United States and Israel have a, 
have an agreement that they're not going that the Navy's not going to monitor Israel's communications. Well, how, do, how does Israel know that uh, the United States is going to abide by that? So they, they don't. Uh, so they, they probably thought that the United States might be listening in and that they would uncover their plan to go into Syria. There's also the story, which is true, it was written about in the New York Times, that Israel had murdered hundreds of Egyptian prisoners of war uh, in, in the desert, uh, which they even admitted to. And they offered to pay reparations. So they, they might not have wanted the United States to pick up the communications related to that. Because if that got out, then obviously it, it would cause a problem. Uh, so the main reason is, I think, is that they didn't want the United States to find out what their plans were for Syria, uh, because uh, the Six-Day War is called uh, a um, an unbelievable uh, victory for Israel. Uh, it was a brilliant, uh, you know, brilliant war. The way that they they, they carried it out. Uh, a lot of stuff is not talked about in the in the mainstream about how they did that and one of the